Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martin Jean. I'm director of the Institute of Sacred Music here at Yale, and it's a great privilege to welcome you all here today as we open the second major public event for our new program in music and the black church. And before we do a single other thing, we need to give thanks for and a shout out to our faculty program director of this new program and the architect of all these proceedings, Professor Braxton Shelley. He's standing right there. <laughs> and equal shout out and thanksgiving for our many staff members who uh, supported the work of this weekend's activity. Dr. Evan Graves, I think I saw him slip out there a minute, <laughs> just a minute ago. Our program manager, Eric Donnelly, Sachin Ramabhadran, Ray Vogel, Melissa Mayer, Rondesia Curry, so many others in the office who support this work. I'm just very proud and very grateful to call them colleagues. So another shout out to them if you don't mind. Your presence here is witness to so much, 
to the resilience of life in the face of so much loss, to the beacon of light that black churches represent in the world, and to the beauty, complexity, excellence, and power of its music that we engage here today. Your witness is one more thing, however. It is a holy disruption. A disruption in the machinations of the so-called secular academy, whose internal and at times capitalistic urges tend to marginalize religious voices and treat the life of faith as something to be examined and dissected rather than as a source of inspiration, liberation, and new life. To be sure, reform may be needed in many of our communities, and there might be some small ways the academy can be a partner in this. But there are experts here far more skilled than I who can speak to that project. My mission here is simply to give thanks. To give thanks to all of you for the time, effort, and energy it took to detach yourself from family and work, to travel here through all the mediums that you used to mask up again, or not. <laughs> to orient yourself to strange surroundings and to prepare for the work ahead. We are all very, very grateful indeed. But my other mission here is to celebrate the music around which we gather. Music that for so long has had no place in the academy, but that dominates life in the real world. Music, I believe, and here please forgive my lapse into normative confessional speak, music that pulses with the very heart of God. To be sure, a God known by very many names, but one who hung the stars, parted the waters, and loved us into being. A love so deep to cause God to give of God's self in the form that at least my tradition names Jesus. A witness and act of love that stands in the face of oppression, evil, illness, and war, and will, at the end, have the last word. It is ultimately this heart that gathers us, redeems, and sustains us, and to whose name now we dedicate these proceedings. Welcome again. Let's give it up one more time for Dr. Martin Jean. <laughs> to pull off anything like what we're doing this weekend and what we will be doing in the years to come takes a lot of administrative will, a lot of support, a lot of yeses. And Dr. Jean has been handing those out discerningly and generously, and you're here today in part because of that. I'm excited to be here. How about you? 
My, uh, my friend, Professor Cornell West, is, is known to say that uh, black sacred music is America's greatest gift to the world. Uh, to some, this might seem to be a surprising, perhaps indefensible claim. Some might locate America's most important uh, contribution to the world in science or technology. Some might prefer to locate it in some more traditional product or commodity. But I am, as you might suspect, sympathetic to what Brother West has to say about this because of my experiences, experiences like what we had last night. How many of you were with us last night in Marquand Chapel? Something happened in Marquand last night as Nadelka Prescott sang Judith McAllister's High Praise, as Dr. Preston Wilson sang Robert Fryson's Just Want to Praise You, as Dr. Melanie Hill played Walter Hawkins' Be Grateful, as Avis Graves sang Andre Crouch's The Blood, as Joshua Campbell turned it into a vamp, as uh, Dr. Patrice Turner sang Brenda Joyce Moore's Perfect Praise, and Reverend Rylan Harris led us through Rodney Bryant's We Offer Praise. Something happened in the sanctuary. The beautiful sanctuary of Marquand became something even more beautiful, became an intersection a conjunction, a meeting place where time and eternity, temporality and transcendence, the world we call natural and the realm we know to be spiritual came into meaningful contact. That was special last night, but not unique. It happens so many times when black sacred music of various genres is lifted, and that's what we're here to celebrate. That's why I tend to agree with Brother West that black sacred music is America's most important contribution to the world. I'm so happy to see you here, those of you who will make your way as this goes on. All of you who've logged on to YouTube, we appreciate and feel your presence also. Some of the greatest minds, greatest practitioners are on this campus. You will hear from them today in sermon, in song, in hymn, in gospel, in spiritual, we'll hear it all done in excellence. So then, we are ready to proceed into our program. We've had several sound checks already. The mics are ready, and the cameras are ready, and the, 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 the instruments, I can already tell, are tuned to the limits of human perfection. But we need to do one more thing this afternoon. We need to have a sanctuary check. We need to, uh, to, to, to ascertain whether or not this space in the old refectory can become sanctuary. But I can't do that by myself. I need some help. So come on, just help me to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. God made us, not we ourselves. We are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. So come on now and enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless God's name. Why? Because the Lord is good. Can I say that again? I said the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. I think we've got a sanctuary in here this afternoon. Before we go further, the pastor of the Varick uh, Memorial Amy Zion Church is going to come with an invocation, Reverend Kelsey Still, and then we'll be on to our program with Dr. Louise Toppin. Thank you for coming. May we pray? God, thank you for the opportunity to gather in this sacred place. You said in your word how good and how pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. Hear us, Lord. Receive our worship. For we realize, Lord, that it's therapeutic. And we ask you today, make it rejuvenating, make it reviving, but also make it reaffirming 
that you are God and beside you there is none other. Amen. Those of you in the audience who don't mind lifting your voice with this chorus, give me a clean heart. Give me a clean heart. So Lord, fix my heart so that I may be used by thee, for I'm not worthy.
Good afternoon. Sorry about that. Time changes. It just it goes around. I would like to thank Dr. Shelley for the invitation to speak with you about the spiritual and black sacred music. It is an honor to be a part of this symposium and to speak on this topic. I also want to make an apology right off the bat that I have to catch a flight and will be leaving immediately after I speak because I have to be in North Carolina by 7 o'clock tonight. So pray for my flight, for going to LaGuardia, and for getting there safely. I'd like to start this way. <clears throat> my sister wants to go there too. My sister wants to go there too. My sister wants to go there too, to sit at the feet of Jesus. Way up in heaven, way up in heaven, way up in heaven, to sit on seat beside of Jesus. I learned that spiritual, which has several more verses, a cappella, as an a cappella song because my coach, Sylvia Olden Lee, wanted me as a young opera singer to experience spirituals in a form that to her was as close to presenting from authenticity, that is, in a manner that the enslaved Africans sang them. I was taught the song by rote, and sang it without accompaniment to emphasize the message of the text and the power of the melody. This early experience is one I continue to reflect on as I sing and record these songs today. As my colleagues have already said, spirituals have informed and indeed shaped our musical landscape from its inception through the blues, jazz, gospel, R&B, soul, concert music, hip hop, and every musical innovation in between. Think about that. 
the spiritual is your root music. It has permeated all segments of our music industry, both secular and sacred. With such an august group gathered today, there is probably little need for me to explain what a spiritual actually is, per se, but I would like to remind us of the origins and purpose of this music as we reflect on its enduring power of these songs throughout history and their place in black sacred music. The history of these songs began long before the creators reached the shores of what we now call the United States and the Caribbean. The musical practices associated with spirituals emanated from the continent of Africa where singing and dancing served a functional purpose. When I say functional, I'm referring to a practice of accompanying daily life and work with music and dance, rather than the European practice of reserving music and dance for specified periods of entertainment as they found in Europe. Let us consider elements of African music for a minute and reflect on any existing practices in current black sacred music. When I ask students in my African American art song class or my music from Africa to hip hop class to describe African music, what is it they invariably say? There's drumming. <laughs> because that could be used for communication. That is only scratching the surface as there are more musical choices than that. In addition to membranophones, which are drums, there's a wide array of musical instruments associated with African music, such as pottery, udu, idiophones, such as mbira, finger pianos, balaphones, xylophones, rattles, such as jawbones of animals, shakers. African music also included aerophones, which were blown instruments, such as trumpets, horns, flutes, and chordophones, which included stringed instruments such as harps and choras, a precursor to the banjo. How many of that, how many made you think, how much of that list made you think yourself? Did you always say drumming first too? The music had elements of stratification, that is layering a texture on top of a texture. It had call and response. It had polyphonic rhythms, which are complex rhythmic patterns and improvisation. The characteristics of the singing displayed a variety of vocalisms, not just one style, including nasality, bright vowels, moans, guttural sounds, and humming. This is part of the performance practice. Most importantly, the music was communal. Communal. Spirituals which were birthed from African music are therefore derived from a complex, not a simplistic musical palette. As an aside, I have to say that there were accounts of European travelers to the continent of Africa. And so many times they heard the music and they would disregard it as unpalatable and barbaric because they could not understand the structure, nor more importantly, they couldn't write it down because they didn't have a musical system. So is this music that is, this is not unsophisticated music and therefore the music that came to the United States is more complicated. African culture itself was preserved by professional musicians who memorized not only the music but vast quantities of history. These people were storytellers called griots or jellies or jolly depending on where in the continent. Therefore, when the enslaved Africans arrived to the New World, although instruments were banned, musical practices, communal singing, creating rhythm with the body, clapping and stomping, dancing and storytelling through song were retained and transformed into songs that chronicled their lives as enslaved people. I think that's pretty amazing that they found a way to create a new language, musical language. As an example of one of these songs, I'm gonna sing a short piece called, Lord, How Come Me Here? 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 I wish I never was
that tells a real story. It tells you who the people were and what they went through. Early secular field hollers, vocalisms, work songs, um, and even protest songs served many functions as they had in Africa when they were created by the enslaved Africans. They were used to express grief, tell stories, and even preached morality to the community. One of my favorites for that is, I met my preacher the other day, gave him my right hand, and just as soon as ever, my back was turned. He scandalized my name. Do you call that a preacher? Say no. Do you call that a preacher? Do you call it a preacher? He scandalized my name. They went through everybody in the community. <laughs> so they started with preachers, but they got down to everybody, everybody. <laughs> More importantly, these songs laid the foundation for spirituals that were a synthesis of many elements. Colonial music and religious practices furthered the transformation of African song into spirituals. In the early colonial church, music for worship consisted of psalms printed in a book without the tunes. Therefore, a leader had to line out someone who could read, because remember the colonials, colonial people couldn't necessarily read, colonists couldn't read either. Therefore, a leader had to line out the music in order to teach the tune to the worshipers. Does that sound familiar? The communal singing approach would have been familiar to the enslaved and a practice that is retained to, in many churches today. The most significant element gleaned from the colonists, however, were the biblical stories. The enslaved Africans learned about strong biblical characters who could, they could identify with, such as Moses, right, Joshua, David, Ezekiel, and most of all, Jesus. The lives of these biblical figures helped them create songs devoid of retribution and retaliation in their message, but instead focused on overcoming circumstances, whether in this world or the next. Although the theology used by the enslaved, and I know I'm in a room probably full of preachers, so I'm not a theologian, um, I'm, I'm a singer. Although the theology used in the enslaved Africans may not follow a single biblical story, the songs have messages that are nonetheless quite powerful. There is still much research to be undertaken as we learn more about spirituals and the transmission of the songs, but I'd like to show you a quick example of one biblical spiritual. Um, it's all Little David Play on Your Harp. The interesting, uh, the written forms, I've chose three of them. The first one is by Harry Burley, who was considered the first person to set spirituals in an art song setting, and that is a setting for professional singers. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1866, but his grandfather was enslaved in Maryland. And his tune, which is the best known, is Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah. Then his first verse is, God told Moses, go down into Egypt, tell old Pharaoh, to loose my people. What does David have to do with Moses? <laughs> but although they're not connected, you can see that they're taking powerful character to powerful character um, and putting those together. Then the second verse is down in the valley, O Lord, I didn't go to stay. My soul got happy and I stayed all day. So they're giving you emotion, emotion at that time as well. The next singer who set songs was Roland Hayes in 1887. So 20 years later, He's from Georgia. His is, David had a harp, had 10 strings, touch one string and the whole heaven ring. I say to David, come play me a piece. David said to me, how can I play when I'm in a strange land? So that text is showing more personal relationship between the singer and the, the, the text. But still, we don't know what David has done based on either of these versions, right? They didn't tell you that David killed Goliath. The last person I chose was Margaret Bonds, who was born in 1913, and her family roots are in Texas. She has a different tune. Um, little David, play on your harp. No, that's the other one. Little David, play on your harp. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp. Hallelujah. It's actually interesting to me musically, it goes the opposite direction. The burly goes up, little David play on, 
and she goes, little David, play on your heart. But more importantly, her verse is, Joshua was the son of Nun. He never could stop till his work was done. She would have known Burley's version that talked about Moses. Who does she pick? The person that succeeds Moses and gets the job done and gets them into Canaan. Not the one that takes them out of Egypt at, but doesn't get all the way into Canaan. I thought that was really interesting. And then she says, as a second voice, David was a shepherd boy. He killed Goliath and he shouted for joy. So she's the only one that actually begins to talk about. So there's much we can learn even about regionally what, what's going on with spirituals as well as how um, the theology is being put together. They all have the same purpose, that, little, that David was a powerful character that, took, um, that they wanted to celebrate in, this, in these songs. The culmination of the development of these spoke, folk spirituals co comes from the camp meetings held in the woods in the 1800s. These meetings included people of all races listening to the preaching of black and white preachers. They listened not only to the stories that were shared, but to the musical cadences found within the preaching style. When the, when the meetings were to adjourn, adjourn for the night, the enslaved Africans would retire to their own areas to continue preaching, singing, and dancing the ring shout well into the night. Remnants of the ring shout, which had its roots in African traditional dance, can be found as part of some of our musical practices today, can't they? The features of spirituals include three things I just want to point out. One, the use of a new language or dialect. That is very important. It, the enslaved Africans were not taught English, and they were brilliant enough to create a new language. Not ignorant and creating a, 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 a version of English, but they created a new dialect. I'm happy that Andre Thomas is here because he wrote the foreword for a new book called A New Perspectives for the Use of Dialect in African American Spirituals. So in the academy, they're finally starting to look at this as a language, which I've been teaching for years. It's a language, not, um, and it has specific ways of pronouncing it. Coded references, which we all know, are another hallmark of this music. What brilliance to be able to not only sing in a new language and speak in a new language, but you come up with a code? Um, I think that's pretty amazing. Musically, the pieces use call and response in a variety of repeated patterns, but most importantly, they are communal. They're, they're, if someone starts a tune, people jump in and sing with them. The spirituals were pre prevalent in the early black church prior to emancipation, uh, coupled with hymns such as those that included Richard Allen's Wandering Refrains, which I know you're going to hear about a little bit later. After 1865, there seemed to be diminished interest in singing these songs that reflected the past and a push toward creating new songs that re represented the future, and we know that happened. However, during Reconstruction, the spiritual reemerged when the choral ensemble, the Fifth Jubilee Singers, introduced the spiritual to a worldwide audience. In 1871, they were asked to tour the United States singing Western European music to raise money for their institution that was floundering financially. When the students began to sing spirituals, still away, still away, still away to Jesus, and go down Moses, in their program, audiences responded to the power of this music and turned a tour that was floundering into a rousing success. Subsequent arranged, arranged choral spirituals continue to preserve the spiritual in mostly concert settings. They are in church and worship, and they, they are intended for it, but they are also being preserved very much in a concert hall, which is sort of that antithesis of what I said originally about how this music was, African music was perceived. In addition to the popularity of choral spirituals, as I said, people like Harry Burley in the 1870s created spirituals for opera singers and, and burgeoning concert singers. Um, this took what had been an orally transmitted participatory form of song with an emphasis on the music and message uh, and developed it into a song that emphasized the strength of the performer and his or her ability to deliver the song. So the function of the music changed quite a bit. This did not remove these songs from the church, but provided an avenue for spirituals to thri thrive as entertainment in concerts, schools, 
and non-religious spaces. Although spirituals have been inspirational songs during periods of social unrest used to provide com comfort, strength, inspiration, and so much more for the black community, I hope that they will continue to retain their place of prominence within black sacred music. That is not to say the popularity of spirituals now has diminished um, outside of worship. These songs, in fact, continue to grow in power and popularity with worldwide audiences. African-American composers of concert rep repertoire continue to find inspiration in these songs and relevance. Whether using the spirituals as source material for a new composition, paying homage to it by creating new words and or melodies, creating songs in the style of spirituals, all of this is going on today, creating arrangements of the spiritual reminiscent of the past, a cappella, like I just sang, or extending the tradition to include gospel and hip hop characteristics within the spiritual. These songs are still used as a source for so much creativity. Today, schools and university choirs, solo singers at both predominantly white institutions and HBCUs, opera singers like me, instrumental ensembles, and groups such as Sweet Honey in the Rock are the preservers of our spirituals. Educational organizations such as NAM, National Association of Negro Musicians, which has a mission to preserve spirituals, have begun projects to teach and perform spirituals authentically. This means much of the, of the preservation is occurring outside of worship in addition to worship. I'm hopeful that these songs will retain a place in, sacred, in black sacred music as they shine a light on the history of African American people. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This was, in, this was transformed by the enslaved Africans to this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. I hope the enduring message of these songs will continue to shine a light on African American history for concert goers while informing our thinking about black sacred music practices. Thank you so much. As we turn our attention to the hymnody of the black church, we know that time is filled with swift transition, not that earth unmoved can stand. But if you build your hopes on things eternal, we know how to hold to God's unchanging hand. Join me as you're able. Oh, singing time is filled with swift transition.
about it. When your journey is complete, if to God you have been fair and bright the home in glory, your enraptured soul will be, come on, put your hands up. change in hand oh you can hold to God's unchanging oh you want to be things eternal oh, oh, oh to God's unchanging hand I'm sure the founding fathers of the Yale Divinity School could have never imagined this sound. But I am grateful to Dr. Shelley and to my friend and classmate, Dr. Jean, for this opportunity. After hearing such a great and rousing hymn, my first line is rather depressing. <laughs> in a lecture at the Hampton University Ministers and Musicians Conference in 1995, Reverend Dr. J. Wendell Mapson, Jr. declared that congregational hymn singing is almost a lost art in the black church. He continues, we allow the choir to do all the singing with their special arrangements and contemporary songs that people may enjoy but cannot participate in. He went on to remind us that this spectator worship is not the kind of worship pleasing to God. But he concluded that congregational singing is in the intensive care unit breathing its last breath. Reformed theologian Karl Barth pointed out that singing is not an option for the people of God. It is one of the essential ministries of the church. Listen to Barth. The Christian church sings. It is not a choral society. Its singing is not a concert. But from inner material necessity, it sings. Singing is the highest form of human expression. What we can say quite confidently is that the church which does not sing is not the church. And where it does not really sing, but sighs and mumbles spasmatically, shamefacedly, and with an ill grace, it can be at best only a troubled community which is not sure of its cause and of whose ministry and witness there can be no great expectation. 
he concludes, the praise of God, which finds its concrete culmination in the singing of the community, is one of the indispensable forms of ministry in the church." End quote. To understand hymnody in the black church, we must begin with this historical development. And Dr. Toppin has certainly done a fine job with that. It must be understood that the black church is not a monolithic institution. William D. Watley says, primarily Baptist and Methodist in theology and liturgy, these churches came into existence because of the racism of institutionalized white religion in the United States and are the independent indigenous institutions of a third world people in a third world context. They are the creations of domestically colonized people of primarily African descent whose social location is in the white west but whose mission is international. These churches are completely autonomous, answerable to no other ecclesial body beyond themselves for their actions and dependent on no other sources for their financial support. These are the churches that African Americans have built from the bricks they have made even as they gathered their own straw. Richard Wright once said, our churches are where we dip our bodies in cool springs of hope, where we retain our wholeness and humanity despite the blows of death. The black church from its early existence as gatherings in slave quarters, bush harbors, and later praise houses were known as invisible institutions. However, when blacks began to establish their own churches, two distinct streams of religious traditions influenced the development of black church music. The first stream represent that, represents that associated with and acquired from the white Protestant denominations such as Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians. The second stream represents that associated with those independently developed by blacks, utilizing the concepts and practices retained from their West African heritage. Portia Moltsby clarifies these two. The two streams are easily distinguishable by worship styles, ideology, and musical practices. The musical repertoire of the black congregations that adhered to white Protestant doctrines and liturgies were derived from official hymnals, which include psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. On the other hand, the repertoire of churches where religious ideology and practices were uniquely black consists of black folk spirituals and gospels having derived from one, West African musical traditions, two, black secular idioms and such as blues, jazz, and ragtime, three, original black compositions, and four, white Protestant hymns, anthems, and spirituals by composers such as Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, and Fanny J. Crosby. Even though many of the earliest black hymn writers are not unnamed like the creators of spiritual, spirituals, they are certainly unfamed and unsung. Some of these include Richard Allen, Daniel A. Payne, Joshua Simpson, James Weldon Randolph, Thomas M. Ward, William F. Dickerson, George Patterson McKinney, Charles Price Jones, Charles H. Mason, Garfield T. Haywood, Robert C. Lawson, Singleton James, F. M. Hamilton, Lucius Hosley, and so many more. This list is by no means exhaustive, but certainly deserves to be called in an institution like this where their contributions to the celebration and perpetuation of sacred black song traditions have, have been given voice and for, to these unknown bards 
whose religious lives and lyrics have undeservedly sunk into oblivion. According to Wendell Whalum in his essay, Black Hymnody, the black Methodists and Baptists endorsed Watts hymns, but the Baptists blackened them. They virtually threw out the meter signatures and rhythm, and before 1875 had begun a new system which those based on the style of singing coming from England to America in the 18th century known as lining hymns was drastically different from it. It was congregational singing much like the spiritual but had been but in the text in which the text was retained. The melody sung in parallel intervals, fourths and fifths, sometimes thirds and sixths at cadence points tool a rather crudely shaped line which floated melismatically along, being held together by the deacons who raised and lined it. The singing of hymns has always been an inspiring, edifying, and invigorating experience in the black church. And often hymns sound differently when sung in black churches than when they are sung in white churches. Wyatt T. Walker offers this insight. The black religious community, increasingly urban, took the Euro-American hymn tunes and gave them an exaggerated measure, syncopation, and rendered them in the surge style, closely akin to the black musical imprint of the meter music tradition. This improvisation was augmented by either the piano or organ, and after the turn of the century, both. Once black folks laid hands on the Euro-American hymns and gave them a musical overlay common to the spiritual and the black meter music tradition, the hymns would be forever changed. <laughs> the fact is obvious when the original hymn tune is sung straight, or precisely as the musical notation demands, and then is compared with a rendition by any random body of black worshipers who have never seen one another before. The lyric texts are identical, but the performance musically is another kind altogether. Across the years, there have been some monumental accomplishments in black sacred music. To mention these hymnals and collections would be appropriate. The first of these compiled expressly for the use of black, for a black congregation was published in 1801 by the Reverend Richard Allen, African minister, a collection of spiritual songs and hymns selected from various authors. In 1883, Marshall W. Taylor's hymnal was published, a collection of revival hymns and plantation melodies. The Everlasting Joy, adopted to the use of public and private worship, was published in 1884 in Galveston, Texas. Gospel Pearls, 1921. Songs of Zion, 1981. The African American Heritage Hymnal, 2001. And most recently, One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism, an African American ecumenical hymn in 2018, which included hymnody from the AME, AME Zion, Baptist, Kojic, Disciples of Christ, Episcopalians, Seventh Day Adventists, and the UCCs. Please indulge me as I attempt, given the time, to call a partial list of the great hymn treasures sung by black churches. However, I must begin with three white English hymn writers and one blind white woman whose hymnody we have adopted and adapted. <laughs> Isaac Watts, Alas and Did My Savior Bleed, which became At the Cross after Ralph Hudson added his refrain in the 19th century. Come we that love the Lord, which became We're Marching to Zion after Robert Lowry added his refrain in the 19th century. Go preach my gospel, saith the Lord, from all that dwell below the skies, joy to the world, O oh God, our help in ages past. John Newton, 
amazing grace and glorious things of thee are spoken. In Charles Wesley, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify. Jesus, lover of my soul, love divine, our love's excelling. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, and can it be that I should gain? Father, I stretch my hand to thee. And hark the herald angels sing, which became Jesus, the light of the world, after George Elderkin added his refrain in the 19th century. Buried not far from here, down in Bridgeport, Connecticut, is Fanny J. Crosby, whose Jesus keep me near the cross. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. I am thine, O Lord. Savior more than life to me. Praise him, praise him. To God be the glory. And inscribed on her tombstone, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, how we've blackened those hymns. <laughs> Some of the most familiar black hymn writers include Charles Albert Tinley, Thomas A. Dorsey, Lucy Campbell, Doris Akers, Roberta Martin, Albert Goodson, Kenneth Morris, and Margaret Duro. We've sung her Give Me a Clean Heart already. In reflecting on black sacred music, one must take into consideration what is being sung by closely examining the text. Y.T. Walker said, if you listen to what black people are singing religiously, it will provide a clue as to what is happening to them sociologically. Dr. Aubrey Hendricks, in his essay, I Am the Holy Dope Dealer, The Problems with Gospel Music Today, offers this prophetic insight as a lover and perpetuator of gospel music. Hendrick says, today the prophetic consciousness that with head and heart once told black people to resist white supremacist oppression that bedeviled their every step no longer informs the music that once inspired us to action. Although white skin colored preference remained the creed of this nation, today the prophets call to let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream is seldom voiced in black sacred songs. Songs that once moved the fighting 54th of Massachusetts to brave death for glory. Songs that emboldened Fannie Lou Hamer to proclaim to the forces of J. Edgar Hoover and the KKK that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Songs that help us to brave Bull Connor's vicious beatings with our eyes stayed on freedom, even as our daughters lied bombed in our churches and our sons lied lynched in our yards. Black sacred music, Hendry says, had this power because it took pains to remind us that Pharaoh's army got drowned to remind us that if Daniel didn't, my Lord did de deliver Daniel, so why not everyone? To remind us against that all odds that Joshua and his whole band, and his poor band of Hebrew outcasts fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. He, it gave us songs of the comforting Jesus. Yes, but it also gave us songs of the warrior Jesus. Songs that help us to stand boldly and unbowed before the most efficient engines of oppression and dehumanization ever conceived to declare, ride on King Jesus, no man can a hinder me. Songs of hope and love and resistance and change. Songs that reminded us long before Einstein's drew breath that the arc of the universe is long but it bends toward justice on earth as it is in heaven. Hendrix prophetically, uh, prophetically proclaims, despite the empowering nature of black sacred music and hymns of the past, in the dominant mode of black religious music today, contemporary gospel music, this prophetic voice, this resistance voice, this biblical logic of justice 
is all but still. Gospel music is heard everywhere today, yet unlike the spirituals, it does not press our suit for freedom. It does not call like the spirituals did for Moses way down in Egypt land to tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Hendrick concludes by saying, uh, I love gospel music. However, I love the freedom of my people more. This is a challenge to the hymnody of the black church today and black hymn writers to be more biblically, theologically, and culturally astute as we sing and as people are being formed as we have over the years. We need more hymn writers that are coming out of seminaries that have been theologically empowered and just not musically motivated. The hymn tradition continues today with such writers as Andre Crouch, Richard Smallwood, Nolan Williams, V. Michael McKay, Glenn Burley, Glenn Jones, Carlton Burgess, Charles H. Nix, David Frazier, and yes, Kirk Carr. So as I close in this attempt to talk about hymnody, which is normally a three-hour course for 14 weeks, I am reminded of an awesome mandate for singing by Reverend Charles G. Adams. He says, sing on, church. Sing until the emptiness of materialistic cravings are filled with the transformative challenges of transcendent truth. Sing until dead hopes are revived, dead souls are resurrected, and dead values emerge from the cold tombs of expedient compromise. Sing until people are persuaded to love and young minds are drawn to Christ. Sing until the preacher can preach and the church gets right. Sing until the power of the Lord comes down.
Good afternoon. Let me thank Dr. Braxton Shelley for the invitation to come and to recognize my esteemed colleagues who are gathered today, many of whom could do this lecture much better than I could. I'm certainly grateful to be here. The title of this lecture is The Practical Theology of Praise and Worship. The focus of this presentation is to address the practical theology of praise and worship in the larger context of music and the black church, with convener directed emphasis on the enduring traditions of the black church. With that background in mind, then, let me begin with the truth that some of what passes for praise and worship music in the modern black church is not part of the black church's tradition. Rather, it is mainstream culture's attempt to co-opt black religion and to rob it of its God-gifted, created essence. <laughs> Musically and theologically speaking, the praise and worship of the black church is broader than the mass-marketed melodies that were stolen from the black church in the 1970s and 80s repackaged in the 1990s and sold back at profit to the praise teams of the black church at the dawning of the 21st century. Spirituals and sorrow songs, the call and response praise songs of devotion service, congregational metered hymns, lined hymns, anthems, traditional and contemporary gospel music sung by mass choirs, ensembles, quartets, and soloists. These musical forms and formats form the warp and the woof of traditional praise and worship music in the black church. All of these praise and worship stylings come from the hearts, the minds, the souls and the black bodies of men and women who learned to sing the Lord's song in the strange land of America, the land of chattel slavery and reconstruction and Jim Crow and Reaganomics and the reign of number 45. This shared practical experience is the womb that gives birth to the black artistic creativity and also gives rise to the practical theology of the praise and worship of the black church. In order to speak of the enduring traditions of the black church, one must discern what has endured across the waters of the Middle Passage and the weary years and silent tears of Africans in America. If we had time, I would talk about the external pressures that have besieged the black church, the pressures of surviving in a strange land, intellectual plundering, economic pillaging, internalized self-hatred, while much of the black church, to include its music, remains authentically connected to its enduring tradition, we should be aware that some of it is not. Often that part which is marketed for profit, that which has endured from slave ships and bush arbors to modern storefront churches and mega church cathedrals and every stripe of black church in between is the theology of the black church, that facet of the church militant that proclaims God as liberator and praises and worships God in light of this truth. Let's turn now to definitions, concepts, and constructs that can help us in our quest for contextual exploration of the practical theology of praise and worship. But before we do that, 
I want to define a few things. Before we get to this, I want to establish definitions for praise, worship, and praise and worship. But, but first, let's establish that these words should be viewed principally as verbs, as action words, rather than as nouns. In terms of crafting a practical theology of praise, of worship, of praise and worship, those words and phrase should best be understood as actions because they are only meaningful, theologically speaking, when offered to God. While the psalmist exhorts us to enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise, the action commanded once we enter the presence of God is for us to give thanks, that's praise, and to bless God's name, that's worship. The practical theology of praise, of worship, and of praise and worship is that we take what we have, praise, worship, praise, and worship, and we offer them to God, transforming them by our offering, that's what gives them theological relevance. To praise is to commend, to express approval or admiration, to extol in word or song or deed. It is the way that one demonstrates through activity activity that is readily observable by third parties, one's thankfulness to God. Praise may be direct or indirect. Direct praise occurs when we commend, express approval of God to God. Indirect praise occurs when one does so in the presence of others. Thus, indirect praise is derivative of direct praise and indirect praise might be termed witness. To worship is to acknowledge the worth of someone or something. In our case, to acknowledge the worth of God. In English, the word worship is composed of the root word worth and the suffix ship. The root word means value. The suffix ship indicates the state of. For example, friendship is the state of being friends. To worship, then, is to acknowledge that God has value. In and through one's act of worship, one makes a statement as to how one values God. Music is an act of both praise and worship. Music is praise because it commends, expresses approval, extols God, and music is also worship because it acknowledges God's worth. To offer music to God, whether with solo voice or on instrument, by means of a choir, praise team, or ensemble, it is by definition praise and worship. We address it as a compound phrase to acknowledge that when music is offered to God, both elements, praise and worship, are present and inextricably intertwined. It's important to note that both these activities, praise and worship, are volitional acts, offerings made by the singer and or musician to God. This is the crux of the theology of praise and worship, that in and through music, one makes an offering to God. That music is an offering necessarily speaks to music being a sacrifice. Music is, for those with musical gifts, a principal means by which that person presents his or her body as a living sacrifice in reasonable service to God. The offering of praise, worship, praise and worship are living sacrifices of those whom God in God's mercy has set free. It is the means by which those with musical gifts, the redeemed of the Lord, 
say so. Understanding praise, worship, and praise and worship as sacrificial offerings made to God is key to developing a practical theology of praise and worship. The Bible reminds us that only those sacrifices that are valued by the offeror are acceptable to God. In Genesis chapter 4, the problem with Cain's offering was that he did not offer God his best. Cain offered the fruit of the ground instead of his first fruits, whereas Abel offered the firstlings of his flock. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, King David refuses Aruna's offer of free oxen and a free altar, noting that he would not offer to God a sacrifice that costs him nothing. Understanding music as a sacrificial offering informs the way that we should approach the music of the black church. Praise and worship is more than just the application of vocal prowess and instrumental acumen. Yes, we ought to offer our best to the Lord. Again, that is the principle of sacrifice. And certainly our best can be made better with formal training. But learning and burning are not antithetical propositions when it comes to matters of praise and worship. Learning, formal training, and burning the passion that fuels authentic God-honoring praise and worship work best in concert. Scripture reminds us that our God will take that which is freely offered, bless it, break it, and use it to meet the needs of the multitude. We need only put what we have in God's hands. The enduring tradition of the black church is to put the music that God has given to us into God's hands. For scripture teaches that in and through, through music, we actually give back to God that which God has first given to us. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17 informs us that God is a singer. Our foreparents heard the voice of God singing over them in the holds of slave ships and on plantations and in the wilderness of separate but equal. They heard the voice of God singing over them over my head. I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. We owe it to God to our ancestors, to keep the tradition alive. The praise and worship of God must be grounded in authentic truth, the truth of who God is, God who has made us free through Jesus Christ. The black church owes it to God, to its people, and to its history to maintain an authentic tradition. And dare I say that this tradition has a sound, a sound that ought not be diluted in pursuit of the mainstream. Even as singers and musicians and songwriters bring innovations to the existing body of praise and worship music, we ought to remember that black church music does not need to be validated by other musical forms. The music of the black church is validated by the presence of God who inhabits the praises of God's people. This enduring tradition is God's gift to and through black people to all of Christendom. The black church must be careful that we not act as Esau and sell our birthright for pottage when we remember that the focus of praise and worship is not on the music, not on the gift, not on the gifted, but on the giver, 
then we can maintain the enduring tradition of praise and worship in the black church with God honoring integrity, whereby we bless the Lord at all times and allow God's praise to continually be in our mouth. Amen. We give thanks for these presenters and psalmists. And as we go into the second half, could we be a big choir one more time? Amen. Dr. Richard Smallwood has given us a standard as we lift our hands in total praise to God.
y'all having a good time thus far? Oh, that sounded kind of tepid. I said, are you having a good time so far this afternoon? All right, the program says break, but we are, unlike most church services, on time. And I don't want to squander that because I want Bishop Moore to have all the time he needs. And we have to get out of here by four o'clock in order to set up the stage for tonight's concert. So we're going to continue now with Dr. Sharice Barron talking about Gospel's Platinum Age. musicians don't go anywhere. <laughs> Good afternoon. What a delight to be here with you all. And you must forgive me, I was counting on that break. <laughs> so we're going to see how the Lord really moves. Uh, and as, um, as I just catch my bearings up here, uh, I'm going to see if we can lift up this little song, I know you know it if you're familiar with the black church. Everybody say blessed, say blessed, 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 say blessed, blessed. You can stand up if you want to. You can clap your hands if you want to. You can dance a little bit if you want to. Everybody say blessed, blessed, blessed. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We get down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must cease. For the devil is defeated and we are blessed. We're blessed, we're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed when we come and when we go. For the devil is defeated, and we are blessed. Late in the midnight hour, late in the midnight hour, God's gonna turn it around. It's gonna work in your favor. Hey, 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 late. God, I see you. much for helping me to sing that song. As I get myself together, it is just a blessing to stand before you all here at the Institute of Sacred Music at uh, Yale Divinity School. This is home for me. I am an alumna as well as a uh, 
former postdoctoral fellow in the ISM, so I am just delighted to be a part of this amazing program. And I think I see Hopi Randall in the back, do I? I'm not sure, I'm so sorry if I don't. Forgive me, but thank you for helping me lift that up. Well, let me say, Thank you to Dr. Braxton Shelley and the conference organizers for inviting me to be part of this symposium, which is entitled In the Sanctuary. And I'm sharing with you today some reflections that are largely taken from my current book project, which is entitled The Platinum Age of Gospel. And this book project illuminates the 20 year period from 1993 to 2013, which I have dubbed The Platinum Age. Of gospel. Now let me say that it is exciting to be a part of this uh, symposium as I've already said and it's exciting to see Kirk Carr perform this evening here in his home state of Connecticut and this conference shares the name with his signature praise and worship song which is called In the Sanctuary which was released right in the middle of the Platinum Age. Now, I believe that when we think of the sanctuary, we probably imagine the inside of a church with the pews, the pulpit, the choir loft, or as we used to say in my church that I grew up in, we used to say the choir stand. Uh, and we, when we think of the sanctuary, we think of the holy of holies, we think of a place of worship. But during the period of gospel music that I've spent so much time studying, gospel music doesn't always suit our traditional understandings of music befitting the sanctuary. And in fact, gospel artists, uh, they claimed that they were taking gospel music outside of the church. And they were saying that wherever they go, uh, that becomes the sanctuary or that becomes the church. Whether it's in the club and their music is playing in the club, that then becomes the church. If it's in the car, the car becomes the church. Wherever the gospel artist goes becomes the sanctuary. Now, the ideal of the sanctuary must either be redefined or we must acknowledge that a lot of the most acclaimed and financially successful new gospel music in the period 1993 to 2013 was actually not intended for being sounded in the sanctuary as traditionally defined at all. Now, when people, I think when people traditionally think of gospel music, they probably think of folks wearing robes, they think of folks in the, in the choir in the church wearing robes, singing boisterously about Jesus Christ as they clap their hands and sway from side to side. But I want you to take a moment and think about all the gospel music that you love from the 1990s and the, uh, t the 20 aughts. Take a moment and just think about it. Who do you see? Who do you envision? What do you remember? What were the life uh, the life-changing uh, moments for you, and what was the gospel soundtrack that was going for you in this time? Well, for some, it may have been what I've already described, but it may also be Kirk Franklin and his singers in hip-hop attire, doing hip-hop dance moves, singing and rapping, just as much as it may be uh, someone standing in a choir stand and singing uh, the traditional gospel that we know and love. Now, when my research, uh, as I began to do my research and as I uh, continued to do my research, I saw that the performance practices and the, success, the sales successes of artists like Kirk Franklin were so different from what came before that they represent an entirely new era in gospel music. And that is this era that I am calling the platinum age of gospel. In 1995, gospel music scholar Horace Boyer announced what he deemed was the, the golden age of gospel. Uh, and that period from 45, from 1945 to 1965 uh, is a period in which gospel music was both well established as an, a, an acceptable liturgical music style across black Protestant denominations. And this music was gaining popularity in the mainstream culture. 
Gospel, go, Gospel's Golden Age saw the success of gospel artists including Clara Ward, Sam Cooke, Mahalia Jackson, The Caravans, and a host of gospel quartets such as The Mighty Clouds of Joy. So I've dubbed this period 93 to 2013 as the Platinum Age to recognize succession from Gospel's Golden Age and to acknowledge consumers' acceptance of a more commercialized representation of Gospel. The Platinum Age was um, a period that had two defining characteristics in my estimation. The first is the extraordinary commercial success achieved by numerous gospel artists, which in turn is reflected in the voluminous number of platinum record sales of their artistry, hence the name the Platinum Age. A significant number of national gospel artists align not only their music and lyrics with popular culture, but also their rhetoric, their fashion, and even their dance moves. This was to attract audiences who might not necessarily go to black churches or to churches at all. Second and more striking uh, in terms of characteristics of the, the platinum age of gospel, neo-Pentecostal megachurches ushered in a new aesthetics and theology of gospel music which espoused reconciliation between piety and secularity. Beyond the increased commercialization of gospel in the platinum age, gospel artists were responding to a significant theological shift in the definition of piety that had taken place among leaders of prominent black churches. So the idea of in the world but not of it really changed, which allowed gospel artists to uh, take the music in places and take their careers in directions they just could not go before. Think of people such as Sam Cooke, Rosetta Tharp, and the challenges they faced. We think of Aretha Franklin, who had the help and backing of her father, Reverend Franklin, which allowed her to have some successes that most artists who were great in the popular arena or mainstream just could not get within gospel music. But then we turn a corner uh, in which case we find a, a, a dramatic shift in what is happening. So I have used historical and ethnographic methodologies to critically examine contemporary black American gospel music since the 1990s. And I won't bore you with all of the research that I've done, but trust that I've done quite a bit of it. <laughs> uh, and a lot of the research includes archival uh, research looking at um, sales data, uh, as well as engaging in interviews and so on and so forth. But uh, my project is interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary touching on the study of religion, African and African American studies, and ethnomusicology. My primary contributions in this book project that I'm um, working on is to study gospel music and to, uh, of course, uh, offer three interventions or contributions to the field. The first being to name this period as the platinum, uh, the platinum age of gospel. Secondly, I want to uh, critically analyze and historicize the music and theological changes among Pentecostals, which coincide with this rise of the platinum age. That's a, a historical contribution. And finally, I proffer a theoretical framework for understanding artists' self-representation as relatable to a target audience beyond the artist's normative fan base for gospel artists. That is beyond black American churchgoers and gospel music enthusiasts. Now in the platinum age, many gospel artists were creating music uh, for marketing and ministry to the unchurched or uh, to mainstream consumers who had no allegiance to any church. And uh, gospel artists said that they had to do so in order to witness and to um, be heard among folks who did not know Jesus. Now, it's easy to dismiss all of this as a kind of marketing ploy and a watering down of real gospel to garner mainstream sales, but I'm not trying to necessarily just offer a narrative of decline, even though um, I do uh, agree with many of the critiques that we have heard of um, contemporary gospel music. But instead, I see something else happening, and my work is showing that beyond this increased commercialization, these theological shifts 
in these prominent church spaces and parachurch spaces, in these denominational spaces, in these uh, musical conference spaces, these uh, changes made the space for gospel artists to, um, to take gospel music in other directions, but it also allowed for um, popular artists on the mainstream charts to infiltrate gospel music. So let me give you some concluding thoughts here. In recent months, I have begun to study the work of Kanye West with his Sunday service choir. Um, and I have found that Kanye West, in many ways, is doing the same kind of work to move into the gospel music marketplace that Kirk Franklin and his compatriots did in the 1990s to move into the hip hop world. And I will say this, ultimately the platinum age saw an emphasis in industry, uh, saw an emphasis on crossover to popular music and to white Christian markets. This push to collaborate with secular artists opened the door for pop, hip hop, R &B, and R&B artists to dominate the gospel music mar marketplace as we've seen with Kanye West, who displaced every single gospel artist on the gospel streaming charts with his Donda album, which some would argue is not even legible as a gospel album. And don't get me wrong, I actually like the Sunday Service Choir and I, I really appreciate the work that Kanye West is doing, but his Donda project, which I have heard um, artists, gospel artists say they couldn't even listen through the whole thing, um, it displaced all gospel music uh, and took over the charts. And he's still on the gospel charts when I checked last week. My research has shown that church musicians around the country were energized when they saw the Sunday service choir and they saw gospel artists and musicians um, working with Kanye West and uh, they understood those artists working with Kanye West to be rewarded with proximity to this hip hop mogul, but also having the opportunity to have a um, performance opportunity in the mainstream. And this inspiration was setting the stage to revitalize black church music prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I conclude with this observation that Kanye West can rally the same demographic that gospel artist Kirk Franklin rallied in the 1990s, namely extremely gifted musicians and singers who have been frustrated with the church. What's interesting is that Kirk Franklin and his counterparts in the 1990s created gospel music that crossed over to R&B and hip hop. And in so doing, they created a gospel music canon that is rarely performed in black churches. In a reversal of sorts, Kanye West is re reintroducing gospel classics and gospel choir music in black church spaces. If we understand Kanye West's new gospel music and ecclesial community making as the imagining of new political possibilities along the lines of Richard Eiton's Black Fantastic, then we also understand that Kanye West, or Ye, as he recently changed his name, must contend with the forces of capitalism and colonialism that would hinder the realization of a better ecclesial future than the one we have today. While the momentum was certainly lost because of the pandemic, Kanye West was well on his way to helping recenter black gospel choir music in black American churches. And I would certainly be interested to have a conversation about that uh, as this symposium um, com continues. West took his Sunday service choir from the Calabasas, uh, from Calabasas and the hillsides of the Coachella Festival to center stage in mega churches across the United States. And as a hip hop mogul, Kanye West handily uh, accessed black megachurch platforms and white megachurch platforms. With the choir's penchant for covering and remixing gospel choir classics, West and the Sunday Service Choir disrupted this global praise and worship programming and incited a reclamation of African American heritage in black American worship spaces. Ultimately, 
as a global hip hop celebrity and a political figure chronically in estranged from many black Americans, Kanye West was poised to be an unlikely catalyst for change in black American church music. Um, thank you very much for uh, listening to my presentation and I hope that we can have a conversation about it as the day continues. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. If I were in church on Sunday morning, I would ask everyone to stand, but I'm going to do something a little bit differently, taking a page from the late Bishop G.E. Patterson, who would say, just get one thought on your mind. And when you get that thought on your mind as we sing this song, which echoes from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. The writer of this song said, God is able. So pairing that up with what Bishop would say, when you get that one thought in your mind of what you believe and what you know in your heart, God to be able to do, allow that thought to resonate and hopefully you can join in with us in the singing of this song. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all, all we can ask or think according to the power that works work is in you. God is able to do just what He said He would do. He's gonna fulfill every promise. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. Come on, all we're going to do is sing that verse one more time, and then we're going to sing the chorus. He's able. Let's take it to the top again. Ex exceeding, exceedingly. Abundantly above all, all we can ask or think according to the power. We can take it up right here. Oh, God, God is able to show us what he says, what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. So don't give up on God. Serve 
and evil God. Say, He's able. Oh, I think He can take it out here. It just simply says this war cry. Oh, 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 He's able. You say, Oh, 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 oh He's able. Can you say, Oh, 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 oh He's able. Let me hear you. Oh, 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 He's able. Oh, 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 oh He's able. You say, oh, 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 oh,
is able. Hallelujah. He's able. That was a song as a sermon. Because that song is at the core of the gospel. The core of our proclamation as preachers. So let me just first say thanks to Dr. Braxton Shelley and Dr. Jean for the invitation to be with you. Coming back here, I was on sabbatical in 2010-11 in this space on campus here, and there was a colleague, Thomas Troger, who was here at the time, who passed away just a couple of weeks ago. And Tom was just a generous colleague and a musician as well. Wrote hymns, look him up. Hymnologist, homiletician, amazing gift. And it was such an encouragement to me as I was working on a book on the spirituals and preaching. He also worked with Evans Crawford, if you know who that was for many years, was dean of the chapel at Howard University. And his book called The Hum, about call and response in African-American preaching. It says, with Tom Troger. And so I offer this in honor of Dr. Troger this afternoon. So you could come at this in so many different ways, the musicality of black preaching. Um, but I won't try to tell it all this afternoon. Um, but in 1927, Harlem Renaissance genius James Weldon Johnson wrote a collection of poetry based on his memories of old time black folk sermons he heard preached during his childhood. That collection is none other than God's trombones, seven Negro sermons in verse. In the preface of that book, he remembers one late night at a church when he was dead tired. He said when we reached the church, an exhorter was just concluding a dull sermon. After that, there were two other shorter sermons these sermons proved to be preliminaries, mere curtain raisers for a famed visiting preacher. At last he arose. He was dark brown man, handsome in his gigantic proportions. He appeared to be a bit self-conscious, perhaps impressed by the presence of the distinguished visitor on the platform, and started in to preach a formal sermon from a formal text. The congregation sat apathetic and dozing. He sensed that he was losing his audience and his opportunity. Suddenly, he closed the Bible, stepped out from behind the pulpit, and began to preach. He started intoning the old folk sermon that begins with the creation of the world and ends with Judgment Day. He was at once a changed man, free, at ease, and masterful. The change in the congregation was instantaneous. An electric current ran through the crowd. It was in a moment alive and qui quivering. And all the while, the preacher held it in the palm of his hand. He was wonderful in the way he employed his conscious and unconscious art. He strode the pulpit up and down in what was actually a very rhythmic dance. And he brought into play the full gamut of his wonderful voice, a voice, what shall we say? Not of an organ or a trumpet, but rather of a trombone, the instrument possessing above all others the power to express the wide and varied range of emotions encompassed by the human voice and with greater amplitude. He intoned, he moaned, he pleaded, he blared, he crashed, he thundered. I sat fascinated. And more, I was perhaps against my will, deeply moved. The emotional effect upon me was irresistible. In writing these sermons in poetic form, Johnson writes, I have naturally felt the influence of the spirituals, though it was impossible to create the actual atmosphere that he experienced, like the fervor of the congregation or the undertone of singing or the personality of the preacher. To make his point that illuminates our conversation today, Johnson goes further and says, these poems would better be intoned than read. Why? Because he understood that black preaching was and is music. And as such, there are three points that I'd like to emphasize today. The first is that the musicality of black preaching is spiritual. 
Now, in one sense, I mean spiritual as having to do with the Holy Spirit. Just as the spirituals were given their name because they were believed, as an ex-slave had said, to be revealed by the Holy Spirit, preaching has been called by William C. Turner, singing in the Spirit. What happens in the pulpit in those moments is not merely rhetorical or aesthetic, but deeply theological and particularly pneumatological. It is also spiritual because of the close roots to the spirituals. The slave songs that have been described today as paintings of the human soul in the color of music. Johnson felt the influence of the spirituals in his poetic sermons because there was a natural overlap between preaching and the creation and singing of the spirituals historically. In his study on the chanted sermon, John Michael Spencer says this, a perspicuous correlation exists between black preaching and the antebellum spiritual. For it is most probable that a substantial quantum of spirituals evolved via the preaching event of black worship. Although it is likely that apart from worship, slave preachers worked at composing pleasing combinations of tune and text to later teach their spirituals to their congregations, it is probable that the more frequent development was from extemporaneous sermonizing which crescendoed poco a poco to intoned utterance. This melodious declamation, delineated into quasi-metrical phrases with formulaic cadence, was customarily enhanced by intervening tonal response from the congregation. Responsorial iteration of catchy words, phrases, and sentences resulted in the burgeoning of song to which new verses could be contemporaneously adjoined. Spirituals, he continues, created in such a manner were sometimes evanescent while favorable creations were remembered and perpetuated through oral transmission. So the creation of the spirituals through the extemporaneous musical sermonic delivery of sermons in conjunction with congregational responses was apparently a common feature, so much so that musicologist Eileen Southern names this class of spirituals the homiletic spirituals. Other accounts suggest that the spiritual originated when a song leader was moved by a preacher's sermon, that he or she interrupted the sermon by answering him with a song. Nonetheless, my main point is that the spiritual, that which was musical, was rooted in the preaching moment. Many scholars take a step further, as Spencer does, John Michael Spencer, that slave preachers were probably the main creators and teachers of the spirituals. At least there's a strong suspicion so this means that preachers were singers too. And there's all kinds of theories throughout history and musicology and theology about this, who, who actually created the spirituals and what came first. Was it the sermon or the spiritual? There's no agreement on that. E. Franklin Frazier notes that slave preaching consisted of singing sacred songs, which have come to be known as the spirituals. And so spirituals were not just created in the preaching moment, um, as a kind of accompaniment to the musicality and the congregational talkback, the very nature of preaching itself consisted of singing these songs. So singing the spirituals was a part of what it meant to preach. Even singing the spirituals counted as preaching. John Lovell, myself, Valentino Lassiter, and others would claim that the spirituals are musical sermons themselves. And so all of this is to suggest the convergence of the singing of spirituals and preaching, music and preaching, preaching as music, as spiritual in nature rooted in history. And so the musicality of preaching we consider in the present goes all the way back to the past. It has literally spiritual roots. And so even within African traditions, it was common to think of songs like speech and speech like songs. Henry Mitchell is one scholar who says that the languages of Africa are manifestly tonal. There's a proneness to sing, and the natural self is a musical self. This musical self is poignantly revealed in what is known historically as the chanted folk sermon. Chanting preachers were known as the spiritual preachers as opposed to manuscript preachers. This has something to do with whether one uses a manuscript and, and to assist in one's sermon 
process, but it also suggests the equation of spiritual with a musical type of preaching known as chanting or intoning or hooping or pulling it. There's, a, there's all kinds of names. C.L. Franklin, Caesar Clark, G.E. Patterson, Jasper Williams, Charles G. Adams, Shirley Caesar, so many more make music as they preach in their own way and style. The old homiletical adage is start slow, rise high, strike fire, sit down in a storm. <laughs> the climax of a sermon that shifts to chanting was described in a 1932 essay like this, with the coming of the spirit, there's a the spirit again, the speaker's entire demeanor changes. His voice changed in pitch, takes on a mournful single singing quality, and words flow from his lips in such a manner as to make an understanding of them almost impossible. This would be the point of celebration, to use the words of Henry Mitchell or Frank Thomas. The singing quality of the sermon is also known as giving gravy. And so that's so much better than sermons that are maybe one hot mess or sermons that smell like sheep sometimes. <laughs> but the chanted portion of the sermon is the most obvious convergence of speech and song, but musically speaking, there's also volume, there's pace, there's pause, there's rhythm, there's pitch, there's tone, Perhaps even a dance as the preacher intones, moans, groans, blares, crashes, and thunders for the gospel. Some homiletical musics may sound like hip-hop, others like bebop, some are doo-wop, some are trombones, others are violins or flute, others are piano. Not all hoop, per se, but there is always music. There's always a song. Preachers may quote hymns or spirituals in their sermons. Some will literally sing. Singers will also preach. Think of what Queen of Gospel Music and Pastor Shirley Caesar once said in an interview. She put it like this. She said, I sing my sermons and I preach my songs. The singing and preaching are different sides of a homiletical coin. And so people like William C. Turner would write poetically, talking about the climactic surplus of a sermon. The preacher as an instrument, a flute through which the, the divine air is blown, a harp whose strings are plucked by God. Or in his book, The Jazz of Preaching, Kirk Byron Jones affirms this marriage between music and preaching and says, musicians play notes, preachers play words. Sometimes they even sing them. You might even hear an old-time black preacher like James Weldon Johnson says in his preface, say, I intend to explain the unexplainable, find out the undefinable, ponder over the imponderable, and unscrew the unscrutable. This is music to the ear, even if it is not intoned. And even in his eulogy for Pastor Sandy Ray, Gardner Taylor noted that it was difficult to determine whether in Ray's preaching, and I quote him, one heard music half spoken or speech half sung. And so there's always been this rich interplay of sung speech, spoken word, that continues today in many black preaching traditions because music in many ways has been as natural as breathing. The musical self has been the natural self. The sermons that sing and songs that preach are religiously natural and spiritual, reminding us that we can be filled with the Spirit as we sing. The second point I want to make is that the musicality, and we've heard some of it today, the musicality of black preaching is deeply communal. Preaching is a communal word. The preacher goes to the pulpit from the pew revealing that the preacher is a part of this larger community. It's like the spirituals. You, they're, they're our songs. It's, the sermons are really our sermons, the community sermons. And there's such a rich sense of the communal participation in much of black preaching, or what Evans Crawford calls in his book, The Hum, participant proclamation. What he calls homiletical musicality is nurtured and enhanced by what Paul Gilroy would call the ethics of antiphony. It's a cultural call and response as the congregation talks back to the preacher with amens, with preach it, with go ahead. What else would, would the congregation say to the preacher? 
Take your time, right? Yes, Lord. Glory, hallelujah. Yes, sir. Yes. But sometimes you might hear somebody say, help him, Lord. Right? If somehow the, the preachers are needed some holy help and the sermon isn't going too well. It's still a prayer, though. But many times there is, it can be, an electric current in the crowd. And in conjunction with the congregation, the musicians also respond to the preaching moment, to, right? Accompanying the preacher with harmony and melody and rhythm and counterpoint and improvisation. And so what you have is the preacher, the congregation, the musicians, and God forming what John Michael Spencer would call a sacred symphony. My third and final point is that the musicality of black preaching is essential. It's essential. John Work said that African American soul was a song. Music is not just the, was not just the soul of the civil rights movement and prior in the United States, it is the soul of black folks. W.E.B. Du Bois presents this notion implicitly. If you've ever read that book, there are epigraphic musical refrains of the spirituals at the beginning of each chapter without the lyrics. It's only the melody. We're a melodious people. And so black preaching embodies what Du Bois names as the gift of story and song. In an ill-harmonized and unmelodious land, despite hardships, music is made, and African Americans endured great suffering, but not without a song. Which is why James Cone, in his book on the spirituals and the blues, he says black history is a spiritual. I would say black preaching is a spiritual because it captures the soul of a people in music, which is vital. It makes people like the poet Paul Dunbar say, I sing my song and all is well. Why? Because to sing is to live. To sing even in the pulpit is to be free. As the enslaved revealed, singing was a vital response to death because by doing so, they were countering death with life. And when we make music and preaching, we are countering death with life. Every time someone intones, every time someone sings in the pulpit, they're chanting new life and hope amid death in whatever form, cutting a path through the wilderness of despair. Some scholars would say without songs to sing, life would be diminished. But with a song, sermons give strength to the weak and weary and battered and bruised. Music songs help people endure. During the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, there was a lot of crying, screaming, moaning, groaning in the streets, if you remember the images. But there was also a lot of singing. In one case, Anna Zizi, a 70-year-old woman, had been buried for a week in earthquake rubble that was at least three stories high from the ground. And when she was pulled out of the rubble, they were bringing her down. She was seriously dehydrated and had a broken leg and a dislocated hip. But that didn't stop her. When they pulled her out of the rubble, she didn't ask what the latest, latest Twitter debates about Chris Rock and Will Smith were. When they pulled her out of the rubble, she didn't ask how many unread emails she had. When they pulled her out of the rubble, she didn't ask whether her rescuer was Republican or Democrat. When they pulled her out of the rubble, Anna Zizi began to sing. Her body was worn and her throat was weary, but life was singing. Her song in the rubble was a complete and final refusal to be stopped. That song was a sound of the glad defiance of life bubbling up. And every time we sing in the pulpit, it is God's glad defiance against evil and injustice and oppression. So sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Sing because the gods won't descend without a song. Sing because you can't sing and not change your condition. Sing because he who sings prays twice. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony. Sing like the whining sang. Everything you touch 
is a song. And when God touches the preacher's tongue, the sermon will become a song. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says a sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says a sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says a sing. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. I'm going to preach when the Spirit says a preach. I'm going to preach when the Spirit says a preach. I'm going to preach when the Spirit says preach and obey the Spirit of the Lord. And what are we to preach? He's able. I hate, I hate to follow that. Let me quickly, quickly say that it's preaching time, even though the preaching has already begun. The name W. Darren Moore signifies in the, every corner of the black church excellence and integrity and flat-footed preaching beyond the black church and the National Council of Churches and many other places. The name W. Darren Moore needs no introduction. Still, to do our due diligence, the pastor of Columbus Avenue Amy Zion Church in Boston, Reverend George Woodruff will come and introduce our symposium preacher. Then we'll hear from Dr. Preston Wilson and the ensemble. And then we'll hear priest word from the right Reverend W. Darren Moore. Praise the Lord, everybody. I just feel like this is a prelude to paradise all this that's been going on here. Dr. Braxton Shelley has introduced Bishop Moore. Uh, I'm delighted to know him. Uh, I preached my first sermon under his pastorate at the Jones Tabernacle Amy Zion Church in Indianapolis. Uh, he is a gift to the body of Christ and he will preach until the power of the Lord comes down. How can we hear without a preacher? And how can he preach unless he be sent? The right Reverend William Darren Moore will bring the symposium sermon following the selection. Such a marvelous thing for someone so wretched, yet my soul you have redeemed. No one else could do it. Yet you thought my soul was worth it, so you gave your only son. You gave. Yeah. 
Has he been marvelous to anybody this evening? Has he been marvelous to anybody this evening? Hallelujah. to my Zion family. Please be seated. Amen. Wow. 
Talk about marvelous. What a marvelous, marvelous. Did you call this a symposium? <laughs> this has been church. And we praise God for the move of his spirit in this place. Amen. Let me uh, greet for, and express my gratitude to uh, Dr. Braxton Shelley and then his extraordinary team for their wonderful hospitality. There are so many reasons why I'm appreciative to Dr. Shelley. Uh, first of all, just for the invitation to be here among such outstanding leaders across the life of the church and the academy. I am grateful to you for that invitation. I'm also grateful because you got word out to our Zion family, and it's good to see members of the New England Conference, including the presiding elder of the Boston District, Dr. Jacqueline Grant here, pastors and uh, ministers. It does my heart good to see you. It lets me know that I've got home court advantage. Uh, <laughs> Is that the pastor our mother church, Malcolm Bird, back there? God bless you from Harlem. God bless you, Dr. Bird. Amen. Our pastor of our church here in New Haven, Varick. So we've got uh, two of the three oldest AME Zion churches uh, represented in this place today. So, Dr. Braxton, you are creating kind of a Zion gathering that we celebrate. And you should know uh, that Dr. Braxton may have his ordination with the Baptist Church, but he has associate membership with the AME Zion Church, and so <laughs> we celebrate him. I'm also grateful that you've invited so many people that I did not know would be here, but just does my heart good. Charlita and I, her dad used to invite me when I was a 19-year-old preacher, had no clue what I was doing, and he would invite me down to Salisbury, Maryland to preach six nights uh, for Holy Week. Every year he kept having me back, and uh, I ended up growing old preaching at her dad's church. So thank you so much. I did not know you were going to be here. Love you with the love of God. So again, so many reasons to be grateful. But then I've got some issues with you. I, I thought you had my back. But the last time I preached in this chapel was when I was a student here and Dean David Bartlett was my preaching professor. And he had an exercise where he would have us to preach, and then he would give a lecture on preaching, on homiletics. That was the last time I preached, so that can tell you how well that must have went. <laughs> but today, Dr. Braxton got it out of order. As he let Dr. Luke Powery <laughs> preach what, speak on what preaching ought to be. <laughs> so now that you know what it ought to be, for me to have to get up afterwards, that's out of order. <laughs> so, <laughs> each one of these lecturers today just have been absolutely phenomenal. Will you celebrate them? You know, and then I just have to celebrate these musicians. These, I'm telling you, they are, they are on point. And I see that the organist is ready because uh, Dr. Luke told him that preaching is musicality. And you got the, see, I, you're laughing because those who've heard me preach know that uh, I, I'm not, in fact, my brother who is a musician, uh, uh, and uh, he used to travel with me to try to sing for me before I preach and then back me up after I preach. And one day he said, I want you to know what key you preach in. <laughs> Dr. Abington, he told me, I want you to know your key. And I, and I said, well, I want to know that because these preachers get up here and say, put me in the key of C. 
and they start hooping it out. And so my brother, uh, he said, come here, here's the key you preach. And he looked on the organ. He said, you see these two white keys right here? I said, mm-hmm. He said, you see the crack right between? <laughs> uh, so if you could just be in the vicinity, <laughs> we may be able to get through this together. <laughs> thank you. Amen. So, let me uh, thank uh, Pastor Woodruff uh, for that excellent presentation. That was excellent, right on point. There's a word from the Lord that is found in the Old Testament book. It's from what is deemed a minor prophet, but this, the minor prophets had major words. And so, out of Habakkuk chapter 1, Verses 1 through 4, I'm using Eugene Peterson's uh, paraphrase for my message this afternoon. Habakkuk chapter 1, I want you to look with me as we consider verses 1 through 4. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all of this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. That was back then, y'all. <laughs> The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. The problem, as God gave Habakkuk to see it, God, how long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell, help, murder? Police, before you come to the rescue. Why do you force me to look at evil, stare, stare trouble in the face day after day? Anarchy and violence break out, quarrels and fights all over the place. Law and order fall to pieces. Justice is a joke. The wicked have the righteous hamstrung and stand justice on its head. From this particular prophetic pericope, I would like to ask you to consider the subject with me, makes me want to holler. I need your prayers. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Gracious great and glorious God. We pray that you would grant that anointing that makes preaching practical, that makes preaching possible, that makes preaching personal, but most of all, that makes preaching powerful. Do it all in the matchless, marvelous, majestic, magnanimous name, the only name that eternally matters, the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, we pray. God's people said together, amen. Makes me want to holler. We don't know much about the prophet Habakkuk. In fact, there are only a few verses that offer insights into his biography. They indicate that Habakkuk was both a prophet and a musician. He was in the Levitical choir, responsible for singing praises to God. So Professor Braxton, he was both a preacher and a part of the music ministry. This dual responsibility included having to proclaim the word of God at the same time as he was to praise the worth of God. But finally, this responsibility created for him a deep tension. What was this prophet? preacher, 
praiser, what was this minister, musician, supposed to do about the reality that he saw all around him? In light of Habakkuk's circumstances, he was facing the dilemma. He didn't know what to say in his sermon, and he certainly didn't know what to sing in the choir. How can he preach? How can he praise with the reality of so much pain all around him? He began to question how can he glorify an all-powerful God when the people of God were suffering in such distress. The theme of this book, Habakkuk, is very timely for us because if God is just, why is there so much injustice? How do we understand God as a God of peace when there's so much violence around us? How is the God the giver of life when we see death, disease, and despair on every hand? The prophet was seeing that in particular, the unjust seemed to prosper while the innocent and the marginalized continued to be trampled upon. Where is God? Habakkuk began to acquire. Does God even care? In fact, the prophet begins to lift up his voice and a proper questioning of God by saying, Lord, how long will I call for help and you will not listen? I cry out to you, violence, but you do not deliver us. It's the issue of theodicy. If God is good, then why do bad things happen to good people? It's a familiar scene, people thinking God is absent in the midst of suffering. It was the core dilemma facing the enslaved Africans while they were embracing and reshaping and as these lecturers have profoundly shared, reinterpreting Christianity in America. It is still the cry that is heard globally from the days of uh, the Jewish victims in Nazi concentration camps and persons living in uh, sweltering shacks in Soweto during the apartheid era in South Africa. It is the pleas of those on the streets in Ferguson, Missouri, Sanford, Florida, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and most recently Grand Rapids, Michigan. Every day we see the anguish on the faces of the people in the Ukraine and ask God again and again and again why what are you up to God people at some point look at all the wrong things and wonder why does God seem so distant why does God seem so slow in bringing relief from racism to COVID, from poverty and homelessness to climate change and environmental racism, from global conflicts to domestic violence, it seems as if the problems are unrelenting. Well, Marvin Gaye, that prophet of Motown pulpits, in 1971, released what would be his magnum opus, his greatest work after singing clean cut Motown songs for most of the 60s. Um, I know this audience is steeped in religiosity and academia, uh, and so you won't know these kind of songs, but they were surpy, sweet kind of songs like Ain't No Mountain High Enough with Tammy Terrell and uh, Thinking About My Baby and uh, You're All I Need to Get By and I Heard It Through the Grapevines. Well, uh, eventually, Marvin Gaye became fed up with superficial, syrupy, sweet lyrics when he saw his people were struggling in urban cities and rural communities throughout America. 
and contrary to the requests of, uh, uh, of the leadership of Motown, Barry Gordy, and some of his agents, Marvin Gaye insisted that he was going to offer relevant music to address the hurt of his people. If I could just pause parenthetically and suggest to us that if we are making voices that have no impact on hurting people, we may have the trappings of Christianity, but we are not Christian. So Marvin Gaye began to write differently and he then released in 1971 his album that gripped the charts. It's called What's Going On? The album focuses on issues of poverty and war and race and the environment. And one of the songs on that album called Inner City Blues was also referred to as makes me want to holler. Gay talks about the struggles that are facing urban America in the 70s, and the last verse of that song is eerily relevant to the issues we still face today. You know the words. Crime is increasing. Trigger-happy policing. Panic is spreading. God knows where we're heading. And the chorus could have as easily been sung by Habakkuk as by Joshua. And it simply says, oh, makes me want to holler the way they do my life. Makes me want to holler the way they do my life. Makes me want to holler and throw up both my hands. Beloved, the fact of the matter is the black church throughout our history has refused to be silent about the pain of our people. But it's important that no one misinterprets what a person, particularly in the black church, means when we say throw up our hands. Uh, yes, it can mean I'm tired and I quit. I give up. But don't get it twisted. Because throwing up your hands can also indicate that I'm ready to be lifted higher. And it also can indicate, hey, I got something to say. Hey, I got a testimony. Hey, let me get a word in. And can I suggest that the genius of the black church is that we have not segmentized those three realities. We can lift up our hands out of exasperation. We can lift up our hands out of exhaustion. We can lift up our hands out of pain. We can lift up our hands out of frustration. But we can also lift up our hands in worship and say, I'm ready to go higher. We can lift up our hands out of our aggravation and say, Lord, lift me up. We can also lift up our hands and say, hey, I got a testimony. Hey, I'm a witness. He'll make a way out of no way. Yes, he will. Let me just check the house. Is there a witness in the building? Uh, uh, Y'all sit down. I'm a Methodist bishop. You make me nervous. Uh, it's all the black church. Throughout its history, has refused to become boxed in in the bifurcation. On the one hand, the paralysis of hopelessness, and on the other hand, the arrogance of hubris. We could do both and. James Barrick and Richard Allen both worshiped and worked. Sojourner Truth both prayed and protested. Harriet Tubman both fled and fought. Frederick Douglass both advocated and agitated. James Walker Hood both preached sermons and started schools. Paul Robeson both gave concerts and also confronted, confronted racism. Martin um, Luther King ministered from the pulpit and then took it to the streets. Coretta Scott King 
who by the way was Amy Zion musician before she married a Baptist preacher. Uh, she was both a minister of music and a mentor of youth. So don't try to put us in a box. Don't try to segment us. The fact of the matter is we know how to cry and we know how to praise. We can lament and we can worship with power because the black church has taken hurt and lifted it to such a way to say it may hurt but you won't steal our hope. So I may never get invited back to the chapel at Yale again so let me say it like I feel it. Uh, the black church and black people are the soul of America. I said it, I meant it, and I'm here to represent it. Black folk are the soul of America. And so thank you to this Institute on uh, Sacred Music for having a symposium to talk about soul music. Uh, because when it's done right, it is, and that's why, uh, Dr. Abington, you, you helped me here. Huh? Because the fact of the matter is, when we sing and when we preach, it's a voice of our protest. We throw up our hands because we have been systematically under attack for more than 400 years. Jay Johnson, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security under President Barack Obama, came up with the phrase, if you see something, say something. Martin Luther King said silence is betrayal. So the fact of the matter is don't expect us to be silent when we come to church. Ah, uh, I preach in a number of mainline churches. I speak for a Lutheran and Episcopalian. I speak across this country in various kinds of congregations. But you got to know your context. Uh, isn't that right, Dr. Luke? You got to know your context. You got to know your audience. And the fact of the matter is I don't expect call and response from some of the audiences. But the fact of the matter is when you're in a black church uh, you don't expect folk to keep their mouth shut. We've seen too much to be silent. We, we've been through too much to sit there and look dignified and cute. We, we have endured too many struggles to try to impress you with our deep thoughtful kind of external expression. The fact of the matter is when you've been through what we've been through, you got something to say. Is there a witness in the building? The fact of the matter is it was first slavery, then the Ku Klux Klan, then legalized segregation, then Jim Crow, Crow then housing discrimination, employment discrimination, educational discrimination, now it's mass incarceration, health disparities, uh, environmental racism, voter suppression, police brutality, and you expect me to sit there dry like a potato chip cold like a refrigerator like a lump on the log like the church of the first frozen the truth of the matter is when I think about where we've come from and the fact that we're still here is there anybody here that's got a testimony you ought to open up your mouth and shout I no, that's right. I know that's right. Uh, it's a voice of our protest. Uh, it reminds me that Marvin Gaye didn't stop there, but he went on to give litur lit lit a liturgical lyrics. Mother, 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 there's too many of us crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. We don't need to escalate. You see, war is not the answer, for only love can 
and conquer. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? So I just want to ask, can somebody here give a holy holler? Can somebody here say, I know that that's right? But let me quickly suggest that not only for us is it a voice of our protest, but it is also a voice of prayer. Thank you again, Dr. Luke, because you made reference to a quote that is often attributed to St. Augustine, although I haven't been able to find the exact uh, citation, but uh, St. Augustine sagaciously is credited with saying that when you sing, you pray twice. How powerful, because it recognizes that prayer Prayer is about a divine connection. And that when you sing, you're singing not just with your words, you're singing with your heart. So you throw up your hands, not just in protest, but you're throwing up your hands in order to be lifted higher. These Bible scholars here, these religious and theological students, these who major in biblical languages will tell you that the word Habakkuk means embrace. So while he's protesting, he's saying, I'm yet holding on. <laughs> Somebody ought to shout preach. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that while I'm hurting, I'm still holding. Yeah, while I am in pain, I am still petitioning. While I am struggling, I am still staying close to God because my prayer is the source of my power. And what I love about Habakkuk is he said my prayer is a protest. Back in 2017, uh, I was, some of the Zion people will remember, I was arrested uh, in Washington, D.C. at the Hart Senate building. It's interesting that that could flash on CNN and newspapers all across the country because uh, they had a picture of a bishop uh, being arrested. <laughs> and so I was arrested and uh, along with other church leaders, they put us in handcuffs. And as uh, I was being taken away by the captain of the police, Capitol Police. Uh, interesting, they didn't have that same urgency on January 6th. Uh, but but uh, they didn't like the fact we were there. We were protesting the Trump tax cuts, which was a multi-billion dollar, almost trillion dollar, in fact, giveaway to the wealthiest at the cost of the most marginalized. And so we went there. And here's what we were doing. Uh, here's what we were doing, Dr. Barry. All we were doing was singing and praying, praying and singing, singing and praying. And as they carried us actually put us in a police truck handcuffed. I said to the Capitol Police, I said, uh, uh, sir, all we were doing was singing and praying. And here's what the Capitol Police said to me. Said, sir, singing and praying are considered forms of protest. I paused for a moment. <laughs> I said, Captain, you don't know. You just preached to me. Because the fact of the matter is, that's what our people have understood all along. Because while we were enslaved, we were still singing and praying. And the fact of the matter is that the slave masters thought that our singing and praying was an opiate to keep us calm. They thought our singing and praying was some kind of spirit spiritual escapism, talking about the sweet by and by, talking about pie in the sky, but what they didn't understand, that it was coded singing, that while we were singing and praying, steal away, while we were singing and praying, that up above my head, I hear music in the air, while we were singing and praying, going to go down to Jordan and cross Chile. Jordan, that we were praying and plotting. 
that we were singing and strategizing. And that's what I come to let folk know right now, that when we come together, when we have church, don't think it's just about our singing. Don't tell us it don't take all of that, because we're doing more than just making notes. We're doing more than just having harmony. We're encouraging somebody who's struggling. We are dealing with people who are discouraged and we're letting them know things may look bad all around you, but up above my head, oh, I hear music in the air. Put those hands together and give God the praise. I'm through. I'm through. I'm through. It's a voice of what? Protest. It's a voice of what? Prayer. But finally, it is a voice of praise. And it doesn't mean that I won't struggle. But it means that after all I've been through, Kirk Carr put it this way, I almost let go. Is that your testimony? I felt like I couldn't take life anymore. My problems had me bow. Depression weighed me down. But God held me close so I wouldn't let go. God's mercy kept me so I wouldn't let go. So I'm here today. Oh, I feel right preaching now because God kept me. I'm alive today only because of his grace. He kept me. Now this ain't for everybody, but is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that has a testimony that when I look back over my life and think things over, I can testify. I almost let go. I almost gave up. But is it your testimony that I'm here today because God kept me? I'm here today only because of his grace. I know it's a symposium, but can I get some PhDs to praise him deliberately. Can I get some master's degrees to give master the glory? I'm at Yale today only because God kept me. I'm serving today only because of his grace. And can I tell you something? Presiding Elder Jackie, by the time we get to chapter 3, don't miss it here. That Habakkuk changes his tune. And in fact, the superscription on chapter 3 said it's in the key of Signoth. And what that simply means, give me the key. What key am I in? I give me the key of F because what it meant is that Habakkuk said, tune me up, tune me up because I'm ready to holler. It's a holy holler because Habakkuk said, I'm going back and getting my preacher robe and I'm going to preach but then I'm going to take off my preacher robe and I'm going to put on my choir robe because I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing and preach. I'm going to preach and sing. Well, what are you going to sing, Habakkuk? Even though the fig tree does not blossom, even though the olive shall fail, even though there's no grain in the barn, yet, yet, yet will I 
rejoice in the Lord. Is there anybody here that's got to yet praise? I'm going to praise him yet. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Come on, yell. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It was about a year ago in March we were still with COVID and I was watching my grandson's birthday celebration on live streaming. He had a bouncy house but instead of him celebrating he was in the corner of the bouncy house crying I said to his father why is Carter upset and his father said it's too chaotic in the bouncy house he's afraid of the commotion in the bouncy house but I'll deal with it I said what are you gonna do Deron he said just watch me he kicked off his shoes and he climbed in to the bouncy house and little two-year-old Carter stopped crying and start celebrating you know what the difference was before his daddy was on the outside looking in but then his daddy stepped in to his chaos stepped in to his struggle and Carter said in his spirit if my daddy is here Everything is going to be all right. I got to go now. I got to go. Thank you, Dr. Braxton. But I just want you to know your daddy has stepped in to your situation. Your daddy has stepped in to your pain. So I got to say it. Tragedies are commonplace. All kinds of diseases. People are slipping away. Economies down. People can't get enough pay. But as for me, all I can say Thank you, Lord, for all, all, all you've done for me. Are there any praisers in the house? Is there anybody that can give God praise? Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, open your mouth. Lean back and holler. Yeah, yeah. 
do that, Kent. I think some folks in here like having church, so you better stop that, Kent. We might be here for a while longer. I'm a, uh, don't do that. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Mm. Can we take just about 60 seconds and, and get the praise over with? They dancing in the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm almost afraid to touch this microphone. I think it's kind of on fire still, but uh, somebody wants to holler. <laughs> I'm gonna call to the, to the stage now the Reverend Dr. Frederick Streets. teaches pastoral theology here and is the pastor of Dixwell Avenue, United Church of Christ. He will give us our benediction for this afternoon, and then you can shout all the way to your car. Martin Jean and to Dr. Shirley Braxton, thank you for your transformative leadership of this divinity school. I've been around a little while now, and over the 50 years of being associated with this institution, I have never seen it move in the direction that you, Dr. Shelley and Dean Martin Jean are taking it. Won't you please give them another round of your applause? I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining. Oh, every day. St 
still pressing on. <laughs> Lord, plant my feet on high, higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. New heights I'm gained on tables land. Oh, higher place that I Lift me on, on high, higher, higher ground. Amen. I sing in the king of inspiration. I thank you on the behalf of Dr. James Melvin Washington, a dear beloved friend who the church historian here and at Union Theological Seminary in New York, who was a quintessential scholar of the African-American religious experience in the black church. And Jim did so much here at Yale Divinity School to introduce resources and people to then the early 1970s who sometimes looked at you cross-eyed when you talked about black church history. Jim died unexpectedly at 47 in 1997. But I'm sure, I'm sure, he's at that great getting up morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know I was asked to do a benediction, but I don't know if I'll get this chance again either. So allow me just a quick word. After reading an article in which a clergy person and an atheist discuss why they respectively believe what they did about God, the reader was arrested by the question why he believed in God. The answer came to him, and Kenneth Morris sat down at his piano and wrote, there are some things I may not know. There are some places I cannot go. But this one thing I do know. Yes, God is real. For I can feel him in my soul. That has a particular blessed memory for me because I used to hear Kenneth sing that song regularly. He was the head musician at my church on the south side of Chicago, the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, which some of you may have heard recently on Good Friday, Burned to the Ground. But they will sing a new song, and they will sing in a new sanctuary, God willing, in the next year or so. So thank you all. And thanks again. Let us now look to God. Gracious God, help us to be alert to the graces we receive every day in ways that are small and seemingly unrecognizable, as well as when these graces appear in full measure, causing us to grasp with gratitude. O oh God, help us to remain curious, seeking truth and understanding. Keep our hearts open that we may receive and be conduits of your love and mercy towards others. May our lives, O oh God, be like a song, singing the melodies of hope, the melodies of love, the melodies of faith, and the melodies of renewal. And may your peace be with us always. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord and the people of God said, Amen. One lie. 